wanted to say uh, uh, some words about the uh, war in Iraq, where we stand now, and what the uh, prospects are, um, and, and what the implications are, uh, the larger implications on U.S. foreign policy. Uh, I have a more recent book, came out this fall, uh, called Unintended Consequences, How War in Iraq Strengthened America's Enemies, uh, partly a sequel to the first book, The End of Iraq. But uh, there was a part of the uh, epigraph of The End of Iraq, which I'm going to read to you, because it really, to me, uh, sums up uh, the whole folly of, of the war. Uh, and you will, if you listen carefully, you will understand that my critique of the war is basically a conservative critique. I don't argue that the war was morally wrong. Uh, I don't take a position on that. I simply make the case that we were ineffective at accomplishing our objectives. And so whether you're liberal or conservative, a Democrat or Republican, for or against the previous president of the United States, uh, I think you, everybody can agree that what we should do when we try to accomplish something, we should be effective at, uh, uh, at achieving our objectives. And that we have been totally ineffective is my point, and therefore have not served our national interests. But let me begin with uh, a story that was uh, retold. It's an old story, but retold by Somerset Maugham in 1933. Uh, and by way of background, uh, uh, Samara is a city that's about 60 miles from Baghdad. It is the site of the Oscaria Shrine. Uh, and it was at the Oscaria sh Shrine that the Mahdi uh, disappeared in 868, if I recall the date right. The Mahdi was the... Uh, 12th and last Shiite Imam, and the Shiites believe that uh, he will return, and when he returns, this will augur in an era um, of justice, uh, which will then foretell the end of the world. So it's a, obviously an extremely important place. Uh, and one of the consequences of the U.S. war in Iraq, uh, one of the unintended consequences, was to remove from power the Sunni establishment that had ruled Iraq from its founding in 1921 until the 9th of April, 2003, when uh, US uh, troops toppled the statue of Saddam and uh, chased Saddam out of uh, uh, Baghdad and ultimately to his death. Up, up till uh, 2003, the Sunnis, that is the people from the majority branch of Islam had ruled Iraq, which, however, is a country that had a Shiite majority. And one of the consequences of that, unintended consequences, was to bring into power in Iraq Shiite religious parties, um, many, several of them very closely associated with Iran, that basically became the government of Iraq. And that, in turn, uh, triggered a response by the Sunnis, both against the American invasion, but also particularly against the Shiite rule. Uh, and um, this became a civil war, and the civil war got an enormous boost when, uh, on February 22nd, 2006, uh, 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 Sunni terrorists blew up the Askaria Shrine, shrine this basically one of the holiest places for Shiite Muslims where the uh, where the Mahdi had disappeared. Um, anyhow, the quote from the story from Somerset Maugham goes as follows. There was a merchant in Baghdad who sent his servant to market to buy provisions. And in a little while, the servant came back white and trembling and said, Master, just now when I was in the marketplace, I was jostled by a woman in the crowd. And when I turned, I saw it was death that jostled me. She looked at me and made a threatening gesture. Now, lend me your horse, and I will ride away from this city and avoid my fate. 
I will go to Samara, and there death will not find me. The merchant lent the servant his horse, the servant mounted it, he dug his spurs in its flanks, and as fast as the horse could gallop, he went. Then the merchant went down to the marketplace, and he saw death standing in the crowd, and he came up to death and said, why did you make a threatening gesture to my servant when you saw him this morning? That was not a threatening gesture, Death replied. It was only a start of surprise. I was astonished to see him here in Baghdad, for I had an appointment with him tonight in Samara. And to me, that really sums up, uh, uh, metaphorically, a great deal of what happened in Iraq. What was the purpose of the Iraq War? It was intended uh, to make the United States stronger and more secure by uh, removing a regime that had, as President Bush described it in 2002, uh, one of the worst regimes aspiring to have some of the worst weapons. So it was intended to protect us from weapons of mass destruction. It was intended to demonstrate American leadership in the world by removing this uh, terrible regime uh, successfully, having a successful effort to remake Iraq. Uh, the rest of the world would be admiring of American leadership uh, and therefore more willing to join in and to be supportive of US initiatives. Uh, it was intended to bring democracy to Iraq uh, and have a domino effect on the other authoritarian regimes in the Middle East. Uh, it was, uh, uh, in the first targets were going to be the clerical regime in Iran and the Ba'athist regime in Syria. But eventually the neoconservative architects of the war imagined that uh, it would include the replacement of the monarchy in Saudi Arabia by a more progressive regime, uh, the uh, changes in Egypt where the authoritarian uh, and uh, sclerotic regime of Hosni Mubarak might be replaced. This was the vision. The war in Iraq was intended to intimidate uh, and diminish the power of Iran uh, uh, and, and possibly lead to the overthrow of the regime and certainly intimidate uh, other rogue states like North Korea. Well, where do we stand now? Uh, here we are on the uh, sixth uh, anniversary, or almost, uh, within three days of the uh, toppling of Saddam Hussein. The, um, uh, in terms of uh, making the United States more secure and uh, uh, stronger in the world, we've clearly failed to do that. Uh, Iran, in 2003, had frozen its uranium enrichment program. It had, had a secret ura program to acquire uh, uranium enrichment technology. Uh, that was discovered, uh, and Iran had agreed to freeze it. And at the time we invaded Iraq, it was frozen. A couple of years later, in 2005, when things started to go poorly in Iraq, Iran unfroze its uranium enrichment program and now has, uh, uh, has mastered that, that, the, that most difficult part of the process of developing nuclear weapons. Incidentally, it's not clear that it, Iran's intention is to develop a nuclear weapon, but it clearly wants to master the technology that would enable it to make a nuclear weapon if it so chose. In 2002, North Korea, and of course this is the, you remember the axis of evil, Iraq, Iran, and North Korea. So North Korea, the third member of the so-called axis of evil, uh, was a party to the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. It had um, plutonium that was uh, under, from a research reactor that was under safeguards and, uh, and whose security was assured by regular inspections by the International Atomic Energy Agency. Uh, in 2002 and leading up to the Iraq War, the Bush administration accused the North Koreans of cheating on an agreement with the Clinton administration in which they 
uh, maintained the, the, their membership in the NPT and kept the fuel under safeguards uh, by the, the accusation was that they were engaged in a secret uranium enrichment program. This would be an alternative path that would have given them the material for a nuclear weapon. That may have been true. Uh, the intelligence is unclear. But if they were cheating, they were cheating slowly. Uh, instead, by tearing up the agreement, the North Koreans retaliated by withdrawing from the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, uh, taking that plutonium which had been under safeguards, making at least six nuclear weapons, testing one of them. Uh, and because the U.S. was tied up in Iraq, we had all sorts of tough language from the Bush administration that this was unacceptable, the U.S. would never accept a North Korea with nuclear weapons. And when they got nuclear weapons, what did we actually do about it? Nothing. Again, uh, so today, uh, uh, eight, eight, well, eight years after President Bush said that the great threat to the United States was from rogue states having the worst weapons, we invaded Iraq, uh, which turned out, which we knew, which we knew before we invaded, did not have an ongoing nuclear program because, and nuclear weapons are, in my view, in a category by themselves in terms of weapons of mass destruction. We knew they didn't have an ongoing nuclear program because once there were inspectors back, you can't hide that sort of thing. It requires large industrial facilities. But um, it turned out they didn't have any weapons of mass destruction at all. And at the same time, the other two members of the Axis of Evil have basically made great progress on their nuclear programs, and we've done nothing about it. Again, I, I hope I can persuade you, whether you're liberal or conservative, that that is a failure. Now, in terms of uh, U.S. strength in the world, U.S. leadership, um, uh, as I, somebody who's been involved all my professional life in diplomacy and, and representing the United States uh, or, uh, until just last few years, um, I can say that American prestige and standing in the world has, at least as the end of 2008, never been lower. Uh, let me just take a, an example, Turkey. In, 19, in the year 2000, the Pew Charit, last year of the President Clinton's presidency, the, Chu, the Pew Charitable Trust did a poll in Turkey, which determined that 65% uh, of Turks had a favorable or very favorable opinion of the United States. Now, why did Turks have such a favorable opinion of the United States? Well, there were a number of reasons. One of which is that the U.S. had demonstrated great leadership in, the, in Bosnia and in Kosovo, basically coming to the defense of Muslim peoples who had been part of the Ottoman Empire and uh, where many Turks, especially in the elite, traced their ancestors to Bo Bosnia or, and Kosovo uh, or, uh, or Albania. Uh, but the U.S. had come in in, de in defense of uh, these two Muslim peoples who were victims of genocide uh, or attempted genocide, intervened militarily, and done it extremely successfully. In fact, in two military interventions in Bosnia and Kosovo, the United States intervened, defeated the Serbs without a single U.S. casualty in combat or a single NATO casualty in combat. So we, we look pretty effective. In 2007, Pew Charitable Trust did another poll in Turkey, and it showed that 7% of Turks had a favorable opinion of the United States. 83% had an unfavorable opinion. Uh, that is a stunning turnaround in a country that we hold up, and where President Obama is today, uh, that we hold up as a model of an Islamic state uh, that is secular, pro-Western, and incidentally is, after Germany, uh, the second most populous NATO ally, it located in an absolutely strategic part of the world, basically touching every trouble spot. Uh, and being unpopular has consequences. Turkey was intervening militarily in northern Iraq in 2007 in a way that threatened to destabilize the one uh, uh, secure uh, 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 and successful part of Iraq, the Kurdish region. Uh, and the, one of the reasons it felt it could do that is that 
its respect for the United States had declined so much. Now, what about uh, spreading democracy in the Middle East? I'll come to whether to the state of democracy in Iraq in a middle in a minute, but uh, in Iran. In 2003, you had a moderate regime of uh, President Hatami. He was replaced by the current president, Ahmadinejad, uh, in, who is much more hardline and erratic personality. Uh, in Syria, the Ba'athist regime, which was clearly the next target of the Bush administration, seemed to be in, in crumbling. Now its position is much stronger. In fact, there's been zero democratic fallout, and if anything, the authoritarian regimes are stronger. Uh, the, um, well, there was a, a political consequence uh, uh, of all this. And Karl Rove and the president strategists imagined that the war uh, might uh, entrench, might, would make the Republican Party the, the party of national security and entrench them in office for a long period of time. Uh, and that turns out uh, also not to have uh, turned out the way in which it was intended. Um, this is just some of the, these are just some of the unintended consequences um, of the war. Uh, but turning out in a way that was uh, basically disastrous from the point of view of U.S. national security interests. And, and indeed from the point of view of the personal and political interests of those who are the architects of the war. Uh, so what do we, wh 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 where do things stand and uh, what do we do about it now? There is a, a narrative that you might uh, have um, heard a lot in the last year or so, which is basically uh, that uh, yes, uh, maybe it was a mistake to go into Iraq, uh, but and, and certainly the, the, the Bush administration made a lot of mistakes in the early period, particularly with the uh, occupation government uh, of uh, L. Paul Bremer III, the Coalition Provisional Authority, uh, and then failed to have the right military strategy in 2005, 2006. But in 2007, the president, or at the end of 2006, the president made a bold uh, decision, decided on a new strategy known as the surge, and the corner has now been turned. Uh, and so we're on the verge of victory in Iraq. Uh, there's a sequel to that, which could have a significant impact on the President Obama and this administration, which is that if things go badly, and I think there's a lot of reason to think they will, well, we were winning in two, in, in, at the end of 2008. The new president and Congress came in, and we lost. So we obviously the blame must rest with the new administration. Well, my argument is that we're, we, 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 there's a very good chance that we're not winning right now. And let me uh, explain why. Uh, first, the fundamental problem with Iraq is that, that there are no Iraqis. That's not a, that it is a, that, that, that there isn't a sense among the people of that, peoples of that country uh, uh, that they have a shared identity. There are three main groups. In the south and in Baghdad are the Shiites, uh, about 60% of the population, the overwhelming majority in the area south of Baghdad, and in the capital they're probably 65%. Uh, as I said earlier, th this follows the minority um, branch of Islam, the same branch that is the majority in Iran, and Iraq, Iran, and Bahrain are the only Islamic countries where the Shiites are a majority. Twenty percent of the population are Sunni Arabs, uh, and they're the people who ran Iraq from the day it was founded until April 9th, 2003. The basic history is this. Uh, at the, it, was, it was a part of the Ottoman Empire uh, up until the First World War. The Ottomans sided with the Germans. They were on the losing side. The victorious powers decided to carve up Turkey. Uh, and they, <laughs> I'm glad somebody got the pun. Uh, and they gave, um, <laughs> they gave uh, the 
three provinces that now form uh, Iraq to the British. Uh, the British Lawrence, uh, the fabled British uh, um, military officer, had gone to Syria with Faisal, who was a prince from Arabia, and installed him as king of Syria. Uh, he was a, a Sunni prince from Arabia. However, the victorious powers gave Syria to France, which Lawrence didn't know, uh, and the French promptly kicked Faisal out, so he was unemployed. Well, they then gave him the job as king of Iraq. Uh, the problem was that he was a Sunni, and among the Arabs of Iraq, the Shiites outnumbered the Sunnis by three to one. So uh, the British decided to add the Kurds to Iraq, who today are about 20% of the population. They are uh, Sunnis, but they're not Arabs. And the basically to, to keep the, the Shiites under control, because they were the majority, Faisal used, with British support, two institutions. The bureaucracy, which was staffed at the senior level by Sunnis, and the army, which he created, and again, uh, officered at the senior levels uh, by Sunnis. Uh, and uh, later Iraqi dictators uh, then kept control with two other instruments, the secret police and the associated security services, uh, and the Ba'ath Party. The Kurds, who did not want to be part of Iraq, they, the League of Nations uh, did a survey of what the Kurds wanted. They said their first choice is we want an independent Kurdistan, which they thought they'd been promised by Woodrow Wilson. Uh, this, our second choice is to be part of Turkey, and our third choice is to be part of Iraq. Well, they got the last choice. Um, and they were in continuous rebellion. Uh, and so the history of, of the 80 years of Iraq is of brutal repression aimed at keeping the Shiites in, the Shiites down uh, and the Kurds in. In 1991, the country began to unravel after the first Gulf War when the U.S. intervened after a failed Kurdish uprising, which the U.S. had encouraged and hadn't helped, and created a safe area that became what is today a de facto independent Kurdistan. Uh, and it was supported by a no-fly zone for 14 years, uh, and then, sorry, 12 years, and then after Saddam Hussein was overthrown, uh, Kurdistan has simply, there, there aren't, there are basically no coalition troops there. Kurdistan has gone ahead and developed its own independent identity. It's one of the most pro-American places in the world. It's, uh, coalition troops, they aren't based there, but they're, they're you know, they're, they're visiting all the time. It's, there's nev never been an attack on, on a coalition troop in Kurdistan. Um, it is booming economically, uh, but it has the attributes of an independent state. It has its own elected parliament, its own elected president. Uh, it um, uh, controls its own borders. So if you if you if you need to go to Iraq, uh, you um, you have to have a visa. But if you go to Kurdistan, you'll find in my passport. Uh, many stamps from the Kurdistan region, you won't find an Iraqi visa, because Kurdistan doesn't require visas, even though, in theory, it's part of the internationally recognized state of Iraq. Kurdistan has its own army, the Peshmerga, uh, and it does not allow the Iraqi army on its territory. And until very recently, when the design of the Iraqi flag was changed, it was illegal to fly the Iraqi flag in Kurdistan, even though, incidentally, the president of Iraq is a Kurd. Uh, the Kurds uh, had a referendum in 2005, an uh, informal one, but sponsored by NGOs, but really sanctioned by the Kurdistan government. Population voted 98% for independence. That's what they want. Uh, and they, they, they simply do not accept and will not accept the authority of Baghdad. And their rights are actually enshrined in the Iraqi constitution, which uh, gives the Kurds not only the right to have their own army and government, but says that uh, in effect, uh, that with a very few exceptions, Kurdistan law is superior to Iraqi law in Kurdistan, and if there's any federal law, any Iraqi law, the Kurds have the right to amend or cancel it. Uh, between the Sunnis and the Shiites, uh, both of them would say that they're Iraqi. You, you, you say to a Kurd that he's Iraqi, 
uh, he's insulted with the, I, I can think of three exceptions, the foreign minister, the president, and the deputy prime minister of Iraq. But all of whom still would like an independent Kurdistan if they could have it, but at least they aren't insulted to be called Iraqi. But basically the rest, uh, you know, they're a bit offended. They won't necessarily show it, but that's how they feel. Um, but between the Sunnis and the Shiites, both of them would think of themselves as Iraqi. They simply have different views of what that means. Um, the Sunnis see Iraq as the state that they founded, uh, that they defended, uh, including in that terrible war against Iran from uh, 80 to 88, it was sort of World War II, World War I, twice as long, chewing up men in the trenches, poison gas, all the horrors that you read about World War I, they were replayed in, in that period. Um, and they see the Shiites basically as fifth columnists for Iran. The Shiites uh, uh, see the, uh, feel that they're the majority. By virtue of being the majority, they're entitled to rule in Iraq uh, and to define Iraq as a Shiite state. Now, for some, that means as a religious state. For others, it's a Shiite state by virtue of the majority, and, they, and, the, and being a Shiite is, has elements, although it's a religion, has elements also of an ethnic identity. And Sunnis, including many Sunnis who opposed Saddam Hussein, and there were many who suffered under Saddam, what they can't accept is that Iraq should be defined by a branch of Islam that is not theirs. Actually, you could be a, a non-religious Catholic, uh, but you wouldn't want the United States to be defined as a Protestant state. Uh, even if you didn't really care about very much about your religion or, or vice versa. So basically that's something that unites all um, Sunnis is opposition to the idea that Iraq should be defined as a Shiite state. Uh, so you have these fundamental divisions. And of course, uh, as noted, in the, the, they were the subject of a civil war that began in 2003 with the Sunnis first attacking, or it wasn't a civil war, first attacking uh, the US troops. Uh, that was the beginning of the insurgency. Uh, the insurgency was then joined by this Al-Qaeda element, this Salafi, a strictly strict fund Islamic Sunni fundamentalist element. And it morphed from attacking US troops to attacking Shiites. And, and basically targeted, spectacular attacks targeted on killing large numbers of Shiites. Uh, the, um, uh, and, 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 and that then led to full-scale civil war, Shiite death squads killing Sunnis, uh, sectarian cleansing that separated the, that basically made Baghdad a city in which a purely Sunni, purely Shiite neighborhoods. The Kurds, incidentally, staying out of it, operating as a more or less independent state. Uh, Uh, in, in 2006, the end of 2006, at the same time as President Bush announced the surge, which incidentally, the, the element of the surge was an increase in the number of U.S. troops, not a large one, about 20 percent, combined with different tactics. Instead of staying in bases, the U.S. troops were embedded with the Iraqi troops and training and provided assistance and support. But at the same time, something actually much more significant happened in the Sunni areas, which is that the Sunni tribal leaders uh, decided that the greater threat to them came not from the Americans or even from the Shiites, but from the uh, Sunni fundamentalist element, the Al-Qaeda element, if you will. And why was that? Well, as long as Al-Qaeda was killing Americans or killing Shiites, that was fine with the Sunni sheikhs. But then they began to demand their daughters in forced marriage, which incidentally is just another word for rape. Uh, they began to demand money. Uh, and they began to assassinate the tribal sheikhs. In short, they began to threaten the power, the, the wealth uh, and power structure and the lives of the people who had run the Sunni areas of Iraq. And at that point, they turned to the Americans and said, if you will fund a militia, we'll fight the uh, uh, Islamic fundament the Sunni fundamentalists. The Americans had the wit to say yes, 
And in a very short period of time, they were able to defeat the Al-Qaeda element. No surprise, because after all, they knew where they were, who they were, uh, and these were the very people that they'd been working with until some months before. And that, and that is what produced a, the decline in violence. The surge, I don't mean to diminish it, it helped, but fundamentally it was the change in the Sunnis. Now why is this important? Because to understand Iraq today is to understand that you have in Kurdistan a Kurdish army, the Peshmerga. You have in the Shiite, the Sunni areas, a Sunni army, the Awakening or the Sons of Iraq, 100,000 strong that had been funded by the United States. And in Baghdad and the Shiite areas, you have a Shiite army. It's called the Iraqi army because the Shiites control the state, but it is fundamentally a Shiite-dominated army, and it's an instrument of the, of the Shiite-led state. Uh, and although violence is down, all the issues remain unresolved. And that is the problem for the future. Now, in January, there were provincial elections. And the take on the provincial elections is that the voters rejected the sectarian parties. Well, in fact, they, reject, they voted against the most pro-Iranian of the Shiite parties, a party that was originally named the Supreme Council for the Islamic Revolution in Iraq. And they voted for Maliki, the, the prime minister, who also comes from a sectarian Shiite party called Dawa. And part of the reason was local. The, the Skiri had been in control of eight of the nine southern governorates and it had done a poor job. Services hadn't improved. Um, and so they, they voted for the alternative, which was Maliki. But Maliki did not get any votes to speak of from Sunnis, and there was no voting in Kurdistan because it's on its own electoral cycle. It's functioning like a separate country. So basically, he had no support from Kurds or from Sunnis. Uh, so there, wasn't, there was nothing national or Iraqi in the outcome of those elections. They simply repeated the division of the country into these three communities. Now, one of the things to look at is will the awakening, the Sunni army, the Sunni militia, will it be integrated into the Iraqi security forces? Will its leaders get positions that are appropriate to their, their sense of themselves, of their status? Uh, will their men get paid? Uh, and will they have a voice in, in the government? Or will they be um, cut off, their salaries cut, and their leaders arrested? Basically, in recent months, the Iraqi government's doing, been doing some of both. And the verdict's not in. There's the second issue of the relations between the Arabs and the Kurds. This had not been a problem. This may be the most dangerous problem in Iraq today. Uh, the Iraqi constitution, which is recognizes Kurdistan more or less as a de facto state, gives it the right to override Iraqi law, has a per article, Article 140, which seeks to resolve the disputes between Kurdistan and Arab Iraq over territory. The origin of this is that what defined Kurdistan from 91 until 2003 was the ceasefire line between the Kurdish forces and Saddam Hussein. So it included, but basically it was in the areas that were purely Kurdish, the Kurds controlled, protected from the air by the Americans. But there was a whole area that was south and west of the line, which had had historically, and until recent times, a Kurdish majority. Uh, and that included the province of Kirkuk, and the city of, well, now it's not so clear about the city, but certainly the province of Kirkuk, uh, and a whole lot of other territory from Kanakin uh, in the south of Kurdistan near the Iranian border up to Sinjar on the Syrian border. Uh, and in fact, fights over this territory, in particular Kirkuk, had been one reason why the Kurds and Iraqi, Iraqi governments were never able to make a deal from 1920 right up until 1990. Uh, and for the first time, the Iraqi constitution in 2005 set out a procedure to resolve these disputes. Namely, uh, in these disputed areas where the Iraqi government, mostly Saddam, but actually his predecessors, had expelled the Kurds 
People who were expelled were entitled to come back. They would get their property back. People who had been settled in their place uh, would be voluntarily repatriated back to their homes elsewhere in Iraq, mostly in the South, with compensation. Uh, and then a referendum would be held to determine the status of these areas. Well, and, th and that referendum was meant to be held by the end of 2007. It wasn't held. Meanwhile, the Iraqi government uh, and Maliki has become stronger. He is using the anti-Kurdish card as a way to muster support. Uh, the Kurds say the Iraqi army shouldn't come into Kurdish regions. Uh, the Maliki says it's a national army. He agrees it shouldn't come into the Kurdistan that is defined by the old ceasefire line, but in this disputed area, he says the Iraqi army should come, come in there. And there have been some very dangerous confrontations. Uh, and this really does have the potential uh, to blow up. So I think we can all hope uh, that the worst is over in Iraq, but we may be having a lull rather than uh, any kind of, of permanent solution. And let me just make the point that if this thing does erupt, it is because of conditions that, well, in some sense, long existing conditions, but certainly conditions that were not addressed in the five previous years. Um, let me, uh, well, let me uh, uh, stop here and uh, uh, open this to any questions that you may have. Sir. Um, sir, you, at the beginning of your talk, uh, said that you felt that the, the goals of the war were unsuccessful, and you stated a bunch of goals that included, you know, intimidating our enemies, bringing democracy to the Middle East, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Is it possible that the real goals of the war in Iraq were to generate a ridiculously large revenue stream for vested interests that was, you know, representatives I won't, you know, specify, and also to get vengeance for and provide comeuppance to? A certain former leader's father's uh, uh, own issues, and and finally, uh, in 140, does that speak at all to the, the issue of the Turkmen and the possibility of Turkey and the government in Iraq, and possibly in concert with Iran, uh, doing something that might affect the, the stability and functionality of, of the uh, Kurdistan and region? Thank you, very much. Well, th thank you. Um, I'm not going to. I mean, I have, I have no information that would enable me to speculate on the psychological motives of uh, President George W. Bush uh, as to whether it was out of, as he once commented, because Saddam tried to kill his dad, or whether it was a son trying to show up as dad. I, I, you know, there's a lot of speculation, and, and I think it's maybe there, there, there are people who are qualified to talk about that. I'm, I'm certainly not one, and, and, and I think it, 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 that kind of, of, um, of debate diminishes, the, in some ways, the seriousness of the critique that I make, because it really isn't about George Bush's motiv motivations. It's, a, it's about effectiveness. Mm -hmm. And incidentally, I do not believe uh, that this was about, uh, you know, uh, that they went to war, um, uh, caused you know, 4,000 dead uh, among American troops, uh, tens of thousands of people w impaired for life, plus the havoc in, in Iraq itself for the sake of, of increasing the profits of some American companies. I, I, I don't believe that at all. And, and frankly, I think actually they were idealists and ideologues. And ideologues meaning people who, who, who substitute belief uh, the, 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 they, they believe and the certainty that they're right for pragmatism and cold-headed analysis. And that, to me, is the great flaw. And that's why I, I make the case that the, that the argument I make to you is, I hope, one, that, that really does cross the political spectrum. I, I don't see whether you're, you know, you could be a staunch Republican or conservative, how can you argue that this war has left uh, the U.S. stronger vis-a-vis -vis Iran, that we're better off? The answer is obviously not, uh, unless, you, unless you're so ideological that you are not prepared to look at the facts. 
And that then comes to an extremely important point as far as I'm concerned. And let me say a few words about President Obama and this new administration and its approach to foreign policy. President Obama has the luxury of being pragmatic, because frankly, there's no stomach in this country for any more ideological foreign policy, any more wishful thinking national security. And in my view, to his credit, he is taking advantage of it. Let me just give some examples. Iran. Uh, the, the Bush administration position on Iran was, we don't negotiate with evil. Uh, and the Iranians are evil. So that then left the following alternatives to deal with Iran's nuclear program, which both Bush and Obama equally believe is a threat. Military action or doing nothing. Well, they didn't have the guts to take military action, uh, which I think would have been ill-advised. Incidentally, I think military, you know, analyzing it, military action would work, not by the Israelis, but by the U.S., would work to keep Iran from developing nuclear weapons if it is sustained, and, and the Israelis can't sustain it. But yes, we, we, we don't know every nuclear facility in Iran, but we know enough of them, and we can bomb them. They may be hidden, they may be deep down the ground where our bombs can't reach, but the fact is no scientist, no engineer, no construction worker is going to work on a nuclear facility that's being bombed. So we could indefinitely delay it. But the retaliation, the consequences would be huge. Uh, you know, people talk about Iran closing the Strait of Hormuz, where much of the world's oil passes through. That's one possibility. Iran could also take its own oil offline. And, you know, we'll be sitting there. Remember the summer of 2008 when gas was only $4 a gallon? Oh, those were the days. Uh, so uh, the, the, the military option is there, but it's very unattractive. I, I suppose that's why the previous administration didn't do it. But then the, their alternative was to do nothing. I mean, a lot of tough rhetoric and, and then to do nothing. That's worse than, uh, you know, that's the worst possible alternative. So what has Obama done? He has indicated and reached out to Iran to suggest that we're prepared to negotiate. Now, I have no idea whether negotiation will work or not. Uh, uh, and I discussed this in the book. There are some bases for thinking there, there can be a deal. Uh, I mean, I think that's a possibility. Uh, I think it's a realistic possibility, but I don't know. You can only, you can only tell once you try. But one thing I will say uh, is negotiation itself is not a concession to the other side. And incidentally, the comparison, in fact, Bush went to Israel and, and spoke at the Knesset. He compared the idea of negotiating with Iran to Hitler going to Munich, uh, no, sorry, Chamberlain going to Munich in 1938 to negotiate with Chamberlain to negotiate with Hitler. Chamberlain going to Munich in 1938 <laughs> to negotiate with Hitler, sorry. There was nothing wrong with Chamberlain going to Munich to negotiate with Hitler. What was wrong was giving him Czechoslovakia. If he had been a tough negotiator, maybe there wouldn't have been a Second World War. And I can tell you, as ambassador to Croatia, I negotiated with war criminals. And I have testified in the Hague Tribunal against them, against Slobodan Milosevic, against Milan Martic, who was one of the, um, uh, uh, the, the leader of the rebel Serbs. And from the point of view of a diplomat, it doesn't get much better than that. You know, usually you take abuse from these yeah, awful people. Sure. You get abuse from all these guys, and then you settle scores by writing memoirs that, you know, not that many people read. <laughs> but I got to put these guys in jail. So that's, that, <clears throat> that's really fan, fun. But anyhow, that Iran, is a case, I'm digressing, but Iran is a case of being pragmatic. Look at, look at what he's done with the, uh, uh, the Russians. Met with Medvedev, come up with a treaty to reduce nuclear weapons that, that are totally unusable and only dangerous uh, for us to, to have. Uh, Cuba, again, I'm in Florida, perhaps demonstrating what a fool I am to venture into this territory. But, we can all agree that Castro is terrible and that it's a, a, a brutal regime. But surely, after 49 years, how can anybody argue that the policy of the embargo and isolation has been successful? This, after all, is one of two or three surviving communist regimes. 
And he's indicated that we might have a different course there. And of course, addressing global warming. So I think, I think there's a whole, and I could go on, there's a whole element of pragmatism which, which, which we now have an opportunity to, to conduct our business in a pragmatic way with, uh, with, with clear-headed analysis uh, and in a way that the and, and that that ideology is off the table at least for the time being, and that that's a healthy moment that he's seizing. I'll be promised shorter answers. <laughs> okay, uh, has everybody given up on the idea of possibly partitioning the land in Iraq into three different countries? Well, the the idea of of partitioning is. Um, uh, one that, of course, is associated with uh, uh, the former chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations, Foreign Relations Committee, Joe Biden, who is now the Vice President of the United States. So clearly is an influential part of the thinking of the current administration. But uh, the answer is it, it is not for, and, and Biden would say this too, I think, it's not for the U.S. to be partitioning Iraq. Uh, the, this is a decision for the different communities in Iraq to make. What the U.S. needs to do is to get out of the business of, of forcing the country back together again. Uh, and that's what we were trying to do from 2003 through 2007 when the Bush administration more or less gave up on it. We were, we were in the business of nation building in a country where the people did not wish to have a nation built, or at least a, a, a significant part of them. Uh, so uh, my view is, I, 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 although I'm often identified as an advocate of partition, I say that's not true. Iraq has already broken up. I'm opposed to the U.S. putting it uh, back together again. I do think we have a, an obligation to Kurdistan and to the Kurds. Uh, they've created the one pro-Western, uh, reasonably democratic party, part of the country. They fought on our side in the 2003 war. You know, they're a small nation that put themselves at risk by being our ally. I don't think we should abandon them. Um, uh, but um, as to whether the Sunnis and Shiites have separate states or they fight it out, um, I don't know the answer to that. I don't think that that's for us to, do, to decide, um, but it is... Um, uh, but, I, but I think whatever we do, the, the main focus should be on avoiding violence. And let me just say one word about that. There's a, the, the common wisdom is that if countries break up, it's going to be destabilizing. But the reality is that sometimes holding countries together can be destabilizing. That certainly is the history of Iraq. You ended up with a militarized Sunni dictatorship that not only was bad for the Iraqi people, the peoples of Iraq, but which invaded Iran unprovoked essentially in, two, in 1980, and then Kuwait definitely unprovoked in, in 1990. Um, and other times, countries do break up, uh, and the consequences aren't terrible. Has anybody missed the Soviet Union? <laughs> and Yugoslavia, uh, the tragedy was not that Yugoslavia broke up, although there was something to be said for Yugoslavia, it's that it broke up in violence. And it, it, it was impossible to hold Yugoslavia together, but it was possible to prevent the violence. Diplomatic efforts by the US and the Europeans in 1991 to hold it together meant that we overlooked the, the uh, opportunity to prevent a truly terrible war. I hope I'm not straying too far from your topic, but I wonder if, uh, if you have another book coming out called The End of Afghanistan. Uh, how American incompetence created a war without end. I, I, I do want your feelings on Afghanistan, whether there are parallels or in this matter. Uh, I will decline to comment on that um, because I've been named by the Secretary General of the United Nations uh, to be his uh, deputy special representative to Afghanistan. Uh, I will be heading there in the next, uh, uh, in some weeks. Um, and. It would be both undiplomatic for me to comment, and also um, I'm simply not sufficiently well informed. You talked of um, an independent Kurdistan. Is that an independent within 
Iraq or an independent country, and how would Turkey feel about that? Kurdistan is de facto independent uh, within, uh, here I'm talking about the Kurdistan uh, in northern Iraq. It is de facto independent. Uh, will it someday become de jure independent? That is, will it have a flag, be a member of the United Nations? I think that's likely. Uh, the, I mean, the, 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 basically, the history of the world has been such in recent years that where people in a geographically defined area persistently want their own state, they eventually get it. I mean, if we were having this conversation in 1987 and I told you Lithuania would be independent in four years, you'd think I was crazy. Uh, so I'm guessing that there will be some event that will provide, open the door for, Kur for the Kurds of Iraq to have what they want, which is an independent Kurdistan. Now, what is the attitude of Turkey in, on, in the book Unintended Consequences? For sale out front here. <laughs> hey, tough economy. Um, but I, I have a whole chapter on Turkey, and, and part of it discusses the Turkish attitude toward Kurdistan. Uh, the conventional wisdom uh, is that if the word Kurd is mentioned in the present, uh, presence of a Turkish uh, official, that they'll go ballistic. But in fact, Turkey's approach to the events in Iraqi Kurdistan, and for that matter in Turkish Kurdistan, has been much more sophisticated than, than most people understand in this country. A General Kanan Evron, uh, who was the last military dictator of Turkey, said recently, uh, or a year ago, he said, look, an independent Kurdistan already exists in northern Iraq, and we have to get used to it. Now, that's significant because this is the man who launched the crackdown on the Kurds of Turkey in 1984 and was so virulently, virulently opposed to anything Kurdish, both in Turkey and in northern Iraq. In fact, Turkey has discovered that there are a lot of advantages to dealing with the Kurds in Iraq. After all, who are they? They are secular, which is what Turkey is. They are pro-Western. They aspire to be democratic. And they're not Arabs. Uh, and so there are a number of people who see what exists today in Iraqi Kurdistan as being a rather good buffer to an, a, a pro-Iranian, Shiite-dominated Iraq. And there, are and there are others who even go further and say, hey, if it became independent, it would be dependent on somebody. It's landlocked. That's going to be Turkey. Uh, so there, there is a, a, a opinion has evolved in, in Turkey. I, I, I don't want to overstate this. Uh, if Kurdistan uh, were to declare, I mean, the Iraqi Kurdistan were to declare itself to be independent tomorrow, I think the reaction would be very severe in Turkey. I don't think they would invade, but they likely would seal the borders and make life very difficult. But, uh, but the evolution of the Turkish position uh, over the last five years is, is quite extraordinary. Let me just make one further point. Be it, because there is an independent Kurdistan in northern Iraq, de facto maybe someday legally, doesn't mean that it, Kurds in Turkey or Iran or Syria are going to want to join it. For Turkey, of Kurds in Turkey, uh, this is a country that sooner or later will be part of the European Union. It's prosperous, it's stable. It is actually, because of the European uh, Union accession process, it has moved to improve the rights of Kurds in southeast Turkey, allowing them to have Kurdish names and to speak their language, which was illegal, incidentally, uh, in the, in the, even until the, uh, in the, until the end of the 1980s, even to speak in Kurdish. Now there's broadcasting schools. It's not enough. There's still problems. But there's a lot of progress. And in Syria, the demand of the Kurds is not for an independent state or separation. It's actually to get Syrian citizenship, because they're, um, many of them are denied Syrian citizenship. Iran is, is perhaps the place that's most alike uh, Iraq, in the sense that uh, while the Kurds really wanted an autonomous status within Iran, as the repression continues, that could change into a movement for independence. Sir, I was hoping that you might be able to speak to the possibility of uh, a puppet state emerging in Iraq, um, in an Iranian puppet state. Um, it is a majority Shiite uh, country, and um, there's already many reports of Iranian influence in that country. I, I can speak to that because it's already happened. The, the, the unintended consequence of 
I mean, it, it, it's very interesting. Uh, in 2002, President George W. Bush spoke of an axis of evil. Now, uh, <coughs> Uh, that was both historically and geometrically challenged. Because, geometrically, because an axis is between two points, not three. <laughs> historically, because it referred back to the Rome-Berlin axis. Japan, incidentally, wasn't part of the axis. It was an ally, but it wasn't part of the axis. The Rome-Berlin axis, um, uh, which was an alliance. But the axis of evil between Tehran and Baghdad, in, when he gave that speech, these were the two most bitter enemies in the world. The Iraq War, I argue, is the greatest strategic triumph for Iran since the Treaty of Khazari Shireen, which, for those of you who don't quite remember that date, uh, was in 1639. And all I can say is, don't take me on in the history section of Trivial Pursuits. <laughs> What do you think the future in Iraq is going to be now that the awakening has gone back to sleep? That the awakening? Has gone back to sleep. Well, it hasn't gone back to sleep. Uh, but there, I, I, I think the verdict's not in, but there's, there's some worrisome signs, including uh, efforts by the Maliki government to arrest some of the awakening leaders. And if that's the case, they're likely to resist uh, and if the resist, if the, if they're, and, and there's no good outcome. If they're crushed, then of course the door will be opened back to the Al Qaeda and the uh, Sunni fundamentalist element. And of course, if they are not crushed, then we have a civil war. That was before 2006, a war between uh, in, uh, an Iraqi, an organized army, and unorganized insurgents but could become a war between an organized Shiite army and an organized Sunni army. It's also, I, I mean, I will say, I think it's possible that this could be worked out, uh, and I hope it will be worked out.